Hello, everyone. I'm Yuko Kaifu, the president of Japan House Los Angeles. I wish you welcome you all to today's very special program, The World of Kengo Kuma, New Form of Encounter Between Tradition and Modernity in Architecture. Mr. Kengo Kuma is a globally acclaimed architect from Japan and is a visionary leader. Through his work with Kengo Kuma and Associates and as a University of Tokyo professor, he has consistently emphasized harmony, sustainability, and diversity in his fusion of traditional forms and materials with state-of-the-art technologies. In today's webinar, we would like to ask him to reflect on some of his groundbreaking works and also to share his vision and philosophy, not just about architecture, but how humans should coexist with nature and each other. The theme is extremely important as we have been faced with unprecedented challenges against humanity, such as global climate change, natural disasters, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. This webinar has been co-presented by Consulate General of Japan in Los Angeles and Japan House Los Angeles. First, I would like to ask Consul General of Japan, Akira Muto, to say a few words. Consul General. Thank you, Yuko. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to join you for today's special event, The World of Kengo Kuma, New Form of Encounter Between Tradition and Modernity in Architecture. We are fortunate to have Mr. Kuma join us today virtually, and I have been looking forward to his talk. This is truly exciting moment for Japan, as we are exactly one month away from opening up the Olympic and Paralympic Games in Tokyo on July the 23rd. Japan is preparing for Tokyo 2020, placing the highest priority on delivering safe and secure games. Our wish is that the games will be a beacon of hope for all people around the world. As some of you may already know, Mr. Kuma is an architect of the Japan National Stadium, a beautiful venue that will be featured at the Tokyo 2020 games. I respect Mr. Kuma and his work very much. I'm so happy to hear him speak today about his groundbreaking breaking work. In Japan, there is growing movement today to appreciate and preserve traditional homes. In the 20th century, homes made of such materials as concrete and glass became popular in Japan. But now there is growing awareness of natural architecture that strives to elevate natural environment in designs and to use local trees for materials. My hope is that Mr. Kuma's idea of Satoyama or woodlands and adjacent to inhabited areas, which he refers to the transition and integration of human and landscape with nature and environment grows worldwide and comes to symbolize Japanese culture. Mr. Kuma is an example of someone who incorporate harmony with nature into his designs, which are highly respected worldwide. Mr. Kuma's work will become even more important as cities and communities explore the best ways to live in harmony with their surroundings. So thank you and have a great evening. Thank you, Consul General Muto, so much. We really are grateful for your great support without which this program would not happen. So thank you again. Before I begin the program, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping notes. Please turn your attention to the screen. Everyone except for the speakers will be muted and videos are turned off. The audience chat will be activated, so please stay engaged throughout the program. If you have questions, please use the Q&A bar at the bottom of your screen to send in questions anytime during the program. We'll try to cover as many questions as possible as the time allows. Lastly, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Japan House website in the near future. Now let's start the program. I'm so happy and honored to introduce our guest, Mr. Kengo Kuma. Mr. Kuma was born in 1954. In his childhood, he was inspired by the National Gymnasium designed by Kenzo Tange, which was built for the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. And he decided to pursue architecture and later enter the architecture program at the University of Tokyo, where he studied under Hiroshi Hara and Yoshichika Uchida. He received master's degree in architecture from the University of Tokyo, where he later became a professor and is currently a professor emeritus. After his time as a visiting scholar at Columbia University in New York, he established his office in Tokyo. Since then, Kengo Kuma and Associates has designed architectural works in over 20 countries and received prestigious awards, including 
the Architectural Institute of Japan Award, the Spirit of Nature Wood Architecture Award in Finland, and the International Stone Architecture Award in Italy, among others. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Mr. Kuma to the screen. Mr. Kuma, can I have you over on the screen? How nice to see you. Thank you so much for making your time out of your very busy schedule. As a matter of fact, we were hoping to have you here in Los Angeles to do physical in-person lecture, but that's for uh, our future, something that we look for to the future. But thank you again so much. Thank you very much, Kaisan, and also Nuto-san. Today, as I want to show some of my projects, and as also I want to talk about the philosophy. And I want to share the screen, and I want to talk about my most important project. Yeah, uh, the first project is Hiroshige Museum. It is completed year 2000. It is my most important project. Why is it so important? Because I learned many things from this project. This is the uh, art of Hiroshige, as maybe you know, this is a beautiful wood block. And he tried to show the phenomena of nature by using lines and points, small points. And also, so this is his masterpiece, layers of space, phenomena and ambiguity of nature. This is by Vincent Bagok and learned many things from Hiroshige. And the Japanese tradition gave a big influence on Western art in end of 19th century. And another example of cultural exchange between Japan and Western West is this architecture by Frank Lloyd Light. The Frank Lloyd Light is an American's great architect. So he really respected Hiroshige. And he wrote about the influence of Hiroshige. And his way of creating this space, creating transparency, creating layering of space, came from Hiroshige. And my Hiroshige Museum is the kind of answer to Wonderland Light. I also want to create transparency and the super juxtaposition layering by using natural material from the place. This is a hole I cut into the building. And through this hole, I want to connect the Satoyama and the village. In Japan, traditionally, people was living with Satoyama. The green zones is showing Satoyama. Why there is shrine? as the age of Satoyama, because the people wanted to preserve Satoyama as possible as can, and they built shrine always at the age of Satoyama. But in 20th century, the Satoyama was totally forgotten, and the shrine was abandoned. And in my Hiroshige Museum, I tried to reconnect Satoyama and the village again, and then I cut the building to create a hole which connects Satoyama and village again. And the uh, material of the building, I tried to use the natural material from Satoyama as possible as can. Utko, of course, I did use cedar from Satoyama. And also for interior, I did use rice paper. This came also from Satoyama. And stone is from the quarry of Satoyama in, in the back mountain. And uh, before 19th century, the material of every building came from Satoyama, and the craftsmen was from village. And then the small local economy was basis of architectural design. But in 20th century, the concrete and the steel destroyed that kind of circulation. And it's very pity for Japan, I think. So Japan, had a rich tradition of using local natural material, but concrete and steel destroyed everything of Japanese culture. And I tried to bring back so those tradition again to my design. This is a small pavilion so we constructed in Italy, but the structure system is very unique. I got the hint from this small the wood block. This wood block has three joint system and uh, without any metal, people constructed those as a joinery. Uh, I worked with my student 
to construct a small pavilion without any nail, bolt, metal. It's just the joinery system. But in next step, I tried to design the real size building by the same joint system. The structurally, the, it is very strong. As you know, Japan has an earthquake is very often, but the, this the structure system support the building without any metal. And also the size of wood is very, very thin, the two inch by two inch. I try to create a kind of forest by using wood. And the next project is a bridge that made by wood. In this small village, as a people was using wooden bridge before, but in 20th century, the, those bridges were replaced by concrete and steel bridges. I tried to use the local wood and uh, with a small the dimension. The small dimension is very important for my building because intimacy is the basis of my design. And intimacy is also the basis of traditional Japanese architecture. And for the same village, the Yusuhara in Kochi, I got the hint from this small thatch roof house. The thatch also was a very important material from Satoyama, but in 20th century, people forgot a unique, beautiful material. So I did use thatch for the facade of the building, and it's, this material is very good to control humidity and temperature of the building. This is interior. Yeah, so people are selling some products and vegetables from the village. And for the, the bigger company, Starbucks, I was asked to design the special Starbucks shop as in front of Dazai Futenmangu Shrine. Location is very unique, just in front of major shrine. So I worked with Japanese carpenter. This is not interior design. The, these, those sticks are supporting the building. It is a structural element. Japanese carpenters found a very unique joint system to support the building. And as uh, in the center of Tokyo, I designed the three-story wooden building supported by same joint system. The dimension of uh, those sticks are section-wise, two inches by two inches, the so same as the Starbucks. And uh, those thin element is supporting three-story building. I learned many things as a, as a from carpenter. And, uh, without uh, the concrete and steel, uh, so we found a way to make this complex building. This is a joint system of the building. Uh, the recent trees, we designed the two bigger buildings in Tokyo. So one is Takanawa Gateway Station. It locates very close to Shinagawa Station. It's a US station for Yamate Line. My idea is use wood for the bigger station. It essentially is the most of the railway station made by concrete and steel, and every station in the world looks very similar. But instead, at so this station, and I did use wood for part of the structure system. And the combination of membrane and the wooden structures is giving us a similar impression of shoji screen. And the shape of the roof is being inspired by origami system. I think origami is a very unique geometrical system, and it is very good to solve this complex function of the, of the station. And as uh, so maybe you know the stadium project for Olympics coming next month. Again, we try to use wood for the building. For bigger stadium, bigger sports facility to use wood is not uh, normal. But as uh, I try to show the richness of Japanese forest. In Japan, still, the 70% of land is occupied by forest. So for developing countries, it is the highest. And also, even in Tokyo, 40% of Tokyo is forest. I think it's amazing. And I want to show that kind of uniqueness of Japanese plant. And uh, design-wise, I was inspired by old Japanese temple. But this is a holy temple, was built 7th century. 
it is called all the wooden building in the world. This building survives as more than a thousand years because of this unique section. The city is of roof protecting wood from weather, rains and sunlight in summers. Japan is a very tough climate, but this unique section is protect the wood from this weather and then it survives. So I did use the same the section system. And also through those streets between the roofs, we try to bring natural wind as possible as can. The goal of this building is not using air conditioning, also to control temperature of the space. In 20th century, the air conditioning has solved everything. But in 21st century, so we should solve, we should use the power of nature to control our space. And this is a sky walkway in the building. So our idea is open this space to public. The most of the sport facilities is closed to public uh, without sports event. I think it's very pity for sports facilities. And instead, we try to open this space to public. This is uh, the entrance for the athlete, so in the stadium. This is the interior of the stadium. The roof is also supported by wood and steel structure combination. And at the edge of the roof, the transparent glass is actually a photovoltaic panel, so which generate the electric, which is used for supplying water to the garden. The effect light filtering system is very similar to the phenomena in the forest. In Japanese, we call it komorebi, as a beautiful phenomenon of natural light in the forest. And also, the, in the nighttime, we try to design this building as a kind of a bombori, the lantern, as a, in the forest. The light is not strong, but it is working as a traditional lantern so in Japan. And as a, what is the wood we use for this building it came from 47 prefectures in Japan. I want to show the diversity of Japanese forest. Japan is a small country, but still we have diversity. We did use cedar, but the color and textures is varies, so it depends on the climate of 47 prefectures. And in the south gate, we did use the wood from Okinawa. For north gate, we did use from Hokkaido. And then maybe you can enjoy the diversity of Japan. It's also an important theme for this design. Last project is Haruki Murakami Library in Waseda University. Maybe the Haruki Murakami is very popular author in Los Angeles. And Waseda University so wanted to have the, his memorial library on the campus. Our idea is to use old building, not demolish the building. We did a small renovation on the old concrete building. We add the wooden screen on this building. It is a, it's a small change, but impression on the building will be changed totally because magic of wood is giving softness and warmness to the building. And this is entrance of the building and it's showing the magic of novel of Murakami. Murakami-san's novel always invite people to tunnel of time. And as a, for my architecture, uh, we also try to create similar tunnel of time. This is the interior of the building. We cut the concrete sub to create a hole of time. And uh, it will open October, and it uh, has library and record collections, and also the cafes, or is a taste of Kogi which will be selected by murakami -san. Maybe it, it can be a unique collaboration with murakami -san, the Waseda, and me. And uh, it's, it's also a good place to show the encounter of the tradition and future of Japan. Yes, thank you very much, uh, kafe -san, please. Thank you so very much. I'm sure that there are tons of other things that you could talk about uh, because you are so prolific. I mean, you, you have more than 200 staff in your Tokyo office and you have your office in Paris and in China as well, engaged in so many, created so many pieces of work around the world. 
so I'd like to ask you later about uh, that aspect of it too, later. But so mm -hmm. you're one of the best known, best established, best acclaimed uh, architect in, in Japan. But I suspect that there must have been some twists and turns, setbacks or ups and downs in your career life. And would you be able to share some of the incidents that perhaps affected or impacted your way of approach to architecture? Yes, I started my office the year 1986. And still, the Japanese economy was booming. The beginning is a good, good start. The bad is so after four years, 1990, the so-called bubble economy was collapsed, and as a, the, every project of Tokyo is cancelled, and uh, it uh, was very shocking for me. But as I decided to travel to the countryside of Japan, and I thought I didn't know the countryside of Japan at all, and then the, through that travel, I could learn something from local craftsmen. And uh, so with them, I built some small building in the Japanese villages. In university, I didn't learn the, the Japanese traditional craftsmanship. I didn't know Japanese local material at all. But the, through the, the trip to countryside in the next coming decade, I learned the many things about Japan. I found how rich the Japanese tradition was. And still, so in the 1990s, the craftsmanship was surviving. And through that experience, my design style was totally changed. So before, my goal of design is, is to create unique shape. But after that trip, I was not interested in silhouette of the building. Materiality and the phenomena, so the, that kind of things became the theme of my architecture design. And then I really appreciate the bustle bubble. It is important. All the works that you've shown today are basically after you went to the rural areas and encounter the nature and the importance of natural material. And I remember that I was reading one of your books and you were talking about Yusuhara in Kochi Prefecture that somewhat um, or largely affected your way of thinking. And you design hotel above the clouds, Kumono Ueno Hotel, and the public library there, and the city office, and all these are beautiful. But I guess that's one of the areas that affected your way of thinking. Yes, yeah, very much. That's beautiful. You did not show this particular piece, but what I love about your works, one of them, is you engage yourself in a huge project like national stadium, museums, all these big refined architectures. But also you engage yourself in smaller ones. Like you did not show the trailer, coffee shop. So it's not like just magnificently a beautiful big project, but you also create uh, something smaller in the communities. Can you talk a little bit about that? For me, to do small projects is very, very important. The size of my office is, uh, is almost a bigger office, but still I want to work for a smaller project because in smaller projects I can do the challenge. I can do the new material, I, I can use the new materials, uh, we can develop the challenging detail. And those things, challenges are possible in small projects. The bigger project, it is also exciting, but many people, as many companies, as many institutes are joining the bigger project. And in that kind of complex, do the challenge is not easy. <laughs> and the, for bigger project, we have tried to apply the funding that we got from smaller project. It is not the kind of experience. Thank you. That's fascinating. It's not there anymore, the trailer cafe. <laughs> <laughs> At the trailer cafe, so we design the wooden trailer house, and uh, it is the product. And the company is still selling the wooden trailer house, and the somebody is uh, are using the smaller cafe for the, the hotel, and somebody is using for this trailer house for the own house. Uh, many people that try to use this as a new type of architecture product. It is opposite of a concrete, so heavy building. 
the lightness and the movability and flexibility. And uh, it is showing the future architecture. And uh, I love that design very much. Thank you. Uh, let me ask you something about Tokyo National Stadium uh, because mm -hmm. the Olympic Games are coming up and people are interested in knowing more about it. It has close to 60,000 seats, including 500 wheelchair seats, and it's huge and it's beautiful. Has there been any technical difficulty in realizing your vision, like wooden structure and things that you talked about? Any technical difficulty or challenges? Or some of the people are asking about earthquake uh, proof. How do you handle that? Actually, to use wood as a well, such bigger building is not so difficult. The structure is a composite structure of steel and wood. Mm. And the uh, advantage of using wood is lightness of wood. Wood is a very light material. So the lightness of wood decreases the total weight of the building. It helps a lot to decrease the size of foundation and that kind of things. And also the recently the treatment of wood has developed a lot. And also the, the sections I mentioned in is protect wood from the harsh air without Tokyo. Did you find a lot of resistance from building code officials or did you do anything extraordinary to make it happen over and beyond what the construction building codes stipulate? Basically, it was constructed under the current building code. And the recent is the building code of Japan changed a little bit. The Japanese government has wanted to increase the use of wood. The government changed it to push the industry, and uh, it's very good for our design. Thank you. So overall, the wood is resilient and can be sustained. It's not like fragile or anything. It can be maintained for many more years to come. So let me turn to something else. So you're obviously working closely with local craftsmanship and natural materials like wood and stone, as you were talking about. And last year at Japan House, uh, earlier uh, in 2020, before the pandemic hit, we hosted an uh, exhibition entitled Hida, a mm. woodwork tradition in the making, featuring woodwork craftsmanship in the Hida region of Japan. And uh, one of them is your work that it's called Kuma Hida, the piece of table and a chair just made beautifully is a combination of natural beauty and texture inherent in, in the wood. So people loved all the pieces of those craftsmanship uh, coming from Hida, Hida Sangyo is the name of the company. But at the same time, we had to take care of it to keep the humidifier all the time because the wood needed humidity. Somewhere like in Los Angeles, it's very, very dry, and we had to give, keep giving moisture into the wooden art craft. And so when you use wood for overseas architectures, of course, uh, they do have different environment, different nature. Do you always think about using natural materials that are there, grown there, inherent there, as opposed to shipping things from Japan? Yeah, it's, it's one of the, uh, the bigger problem for the project outside Japan. And basically, I want to use local wood as possible as you can. And to use local wood is very important for global warming. And the reason is uh, people are talking about the relationship between use of wood and global warming. And the wood can keep carbon oxidized and uh, that we can decrease carbon oxidized in the space, then the, to use local wood is important. If we use the wood from outside for transportation, is against to decrease the, the carbon excess in the space. And also, uh, as you said, the climate of the, the place, local material, is very much related. And if we can use local material, it will fit the climate of the place. But sometimes the cost is against the problem. Right, wood material, lumber, they're uh, getting really, really expensive here in the United States. Cost issue um, mm. of the materials, particularly mm. wood nowadays. In my Portland Japanese Garden project, we did use wood from Oregon. At the beginning, I wanted to use uh, Japanese wood because the texture and color will fit the design of Japanese garden. 
But as a urban company in Oregon showed me some beautiful wood from as Oregon, it's really beautiful. <laughs> and then I decided to use the local material. But as a people really love the combination of local material and Japanese tra traditional design. Mm. So you're always aware of Japanese-ness in your architecture, mm. no matter where you, you do it. In any country, it's a combination of Japanese and local material and local culture. Yeah, my definition on Japanese-ness is not about style. So Japanese-ness is a kind of attitude to material. Mm. So respect to material, respect to place, the all things is the basis of Japanese-ness. Mm, I see. You, you've done quite a few projects in Los Angeles as well. Can you give us a few examples of some of the projects that you did, perhaps in Southern California or in the United States? The, the sounds project is uh, California. It is the beginning of the project. We haven't completed yet the project. Mm. Well, so please come back to do more in <laughs> Southern California. So you value a spiritual and historical connection between humans and natural materials and have been creating buildings that immerse people in nature, natural wood and stones, as that's what our ancestors used to do to live in the woods and by the sea or by the water. And that gives people a sense of comfort and relaxation. But some people can afford to do that. Some people can have this at villa or house in woods or by the, the sea, but not too many of us can afford to do that. We have to live in the cities. We have to live in the hustle bustle of the city. Is there anything that we should be mindful of or what we can do still living in the city, but live in harmony with the nature? Even in the city, there is wind, natural wind, always natural wind is everywhere, mm. and the uh, natural light is everywhere. So, so it is very possible to feel nature in the center of the city. As I always talking about the example of small garden Kyoto, it is a tsuboniwa, it means mm. small gardens. It's actually very small, sometimes one meters by two meters, that kind of small gardens is it can give the magical effect which creates special relationship with nature. The climate of Kyoto is very tough actually, summer are very hot, the winter very cold, but people were using Tsuboniwa to feel nature so even in that the dead city. So you can do, you can make the best of the environment you're in and even just a small patch of land, if it can have winds coming through to where you live or where you work, that probably would give you much of comfort and relaxation. Yes, yes. And few people are asking similar questions, but during the pandemic, we spent mostly isolated from the rest of our community. Uh, we could not really get to see our loved one, your family, your friends, spending a lot of time at home. And we telecommuted that we, we did not really drive too much. We did not go into the office because we do have, like what we were doing today, like Zoom in, has enabled us to communicate and do our work regardless. There are good points and bad points in that, of course. We could not really have person-to-person -person contact, but because we no longer drove as much, there is less of traffic conjunction. Uh, traffic has been light. The skies are clearer and uh, we could make the best use of our time as well. Here in California and overall in the United States, the pandemic situation has been getting better. So the economy has been opening up. People have started to drive more. There has been traffic jam. The skies are no longer blue. So we don't necessarily want to go back to old normal. We want to learn from the pandemic and come up with a new normal. But we are still struggling what it is. What, how can we live our life in a better way, learning from the pandemic? Can you share your thought about it? Yes. I think the, this pandemic is a kind of turning point of the history. From the beginning of history, it was going to density, centralization is a vector of the history. 
to the centers and to the density and to the city and to the tour city is basically better of the history. But now, so finally, we found this direction giving us unhappiness. It is not happy at all. We believed that this direction means happiness. Actually, it is very stressful. It is very unhealthy. It is not good for our body. After this finding, somebody wanted to go back to nature and going back to the countryside. And I think it's a very healthy decision. And the city is not the final solution we found. And uh, we found another solution for our happiness. Architectural design should change drastically after pandemic. We should open up the enclosed the concrete box because concrete box is a basic unit for a big city. We should destroy the, this enclosed box. We should escape the box. Now we are trying to find the new design after the enclosed box. So we should change our lifestyle, the way that we lead our lives, but then architects should be part of the efforts. I mean, we kind of join our efforts to make it more open so that we can get away from the box uh, structure. We have been seeing a lot of gentrifications of old buildings in Los Angeles, and they don't demolish old buildings, but they make the best use of it. So they change it into loft, they change it into their office space. And so that's probably one such thing that, and they try to get more light from the sun and all these kind of things. I mean, it, there is a certain limit to how much we can do in the city, but that's, I, I guess, part of it. Mm -hmm. Because the key words that I come across reading your writings a lot is connection with nature, harmony, neighborhood, community, local, and tattered are like worn out. Sometimes worn out buildings yield some warmth and uh, the sense of communities. I guess that's what it is. Uh, correct me if, if I'm saying something inappropriate or incorrect. Yeah. <laughs> So I've already asked you questions from the audience, more or less, but let me pick up a few more. I guess that it comes from my colleague in Sao Paulo. Uh, you designed Japan House Sao Paulo a few years ago, and there I met you. But could you tell us a bit more about the design of Japan House Sao Paulo and your visit to the Japanese pavilion Sao Paulo designed by Tutemi Horiguchi? So if you can tell me anything about Japan or Sao Paulo, what is the kind of thing that you kept in mind trying to materialize? Japan or Sao Paulo is a kind of renovation project on old concrete building facing Aulistas avenues, this big avenues, but we try to create relationship between the street and the building. And concrete and glass carton wall are always blocking the relation. But instead, so we put the new wooden screen so between street and building. A kind of a transparency was created by wooden screens. And also that wooden screens was made by wood from Japan plus wood from Brazil. It is showing the cultural exchange of two different cultures and two different climate. By adding this screen, the image of concrete box totally change it. And there's a Paulista Avenue, so all occupied by the concrete block. The only Japan house is showing the warmness, mm. and softness, and uh, that softness inviting people to Japan house in Sao Paulo. And uh, many people visiting the Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo, I'm very happy. Yes, there are so many visitors there and uh, it's kind of eye-catching as well. And the warmth is there on the facade of it, so thank you. So another question is, what is the relationship between the education and training and the practice of architecture in Japan? Japan has so many world famous architects, but I haven't heard that Japanese schools of architecture are the best in the world. What is the relationship between the education and the practice of architecture? In Japan, I think the architecture education is still very conservative. And uh, I want to change the education system. By example, we started pavilion project, built pavilion with student by hand. Mm -hmm. 
it is the education system of Japanese carpenters. The carpenters the taught their uh, the technique by using the real material. It is a kind of on-job training, that, that kind of education. Education by text is not enough, I think. Education was based on the material, very necessary for a student. And after I started this pavilion project, my student really enjoy construction itself. The, the construction is not by brain, construction is by hand and body. I want to teach them that kind of things. And uh, in Japan, after the education, uh, most of the young architects learned in the small atelier by masters. And the small atelier is very productive education system, I think. We can learn from masters face by face. It is very helpful, educates the philosophy of architecture to young staffs. I see. So in a nutshell, of course, you can learn and be educated at school, but then what you can learn after you join architectural design studios mm -hmm. and uh, learning from your masters uh, is uh, very significantly important. Yes, yes. Well, I wish that we had more time because there are so many people who want to ask you questions and who want to learn so much from you more. But now the time is up and we have to wrap up our program. So Mr. Kuma, thank you so very much for your talk today. How inspirational. I mean, we learned so much and there are so many things that we kind of take home and think deeply about what you said. Because mm -hmm. it's not just relevant to architects, but to relevant to all of us who live in today's mm -hmm. world. So again, I wish you were here with us physically, but that's for a future opportunity. But the, the silver lining is that there are so many people who signed up and signed in listening from all over the world. So that's a silver lining. And I wish to thank the audience uh, so much as well. When you exit the program, you will be redirected to our survey page. And please take a moment to fill out the survey so that we can continue providing you with the high quality programs in the areas of your interest. Please also follow us on social media platform at Japan House LA and Japan Consular LA to stay up to date on our events and programs. So thank you again so much, Mr. Kuma. Nice seeing you. And thank you everyone for joining us today and have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.